<sighs> so much of the Latin language lives on in the words that we speak today. Immortuous, the immortal, the never dying, the undead. Or zombies, as we like to call them these days. Well, I'm a sucker for a good zombie story as much as anyone else. And tonight's is absolutely fantastic. I'm sure you're going to love this just as much as I did. Well, my dear friends, I think it's time for me to shut up and invite you to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Seven-year-old Tertius bent down and picked up three fist-sized rocks and held them up to show his father. <sighs> good job, son. Those are some good ones. I bet you'll be able to throw them nice and straight. The boy smiled and put the rocks in his pocket, and he and his father joined the throng walking toward the Colosseum. Many in the crowd were singing, and a few couples even broke into impromptu dances as the sun popped out of the clouds and showered them with all golden light. As they approached the grand entrance to the Colosseum, Tertius heard a band begin playing from within. Come on, father, said Tertius. I don't want to miss the battle. He grabbed his father's hand and pulled, and they hurried through the entrance and climbed the steep steps up to the seats that gave them a clear view of the sandy surface of the Colosseum floor. On the other side of the Colosseum, Two men sat in a balcony ten feet above the main floor. The balcony was furnished with ornately carved chairs and silk cushions. Barely dressed women tended to them with fans, drinks, and fresh dates and olives. One of the men was short with a broad stomach that protruded from under his tunic. The other man was taller with thick legs and arms. A purple scar creased his face under his left eye. He looked around the stadium and frowned. Look at this crowd, General Decimus. I told you this would be a success, said the shorter man. The tall man shook his head. I'm still not convinced, he said. What happens if something goes wrong, Gaius? What could go wrong? They will be down there, and we are up here. Besides, the crowd will take care of any survivors. But they are not said Decimus, but then he stopped and shrugged. Hmm. I suppose you're right. Plus, you said it's not as costly as replacing gladiators and slaves. Yeah, and remember, said Gaius, you yourself said the gladiators used to be a big help at the front, even if their loyalty sometimes comes into question. Tell me again how this is going to work, said Decimus. Yeah, very well, said Gaius. After you brought them into the city, it was quickly discovered that they were quite dangerous, as you know. Well, a few escaped into some crowded areas, and soldiers were dispatched. They were able to deal with the immortuous, but not without a great deal of blood being shed. We also saw that the creatures became more enraged and active when they smelled blood. They will also not touch each other if there is no fresh blood present, the real breakthrough came when we observed them and discovered that the younger the blood, the more aggressive they became. From there, I came up with a brilliant plan to pit them against each other. All it takes is to apply a bit of blood and they will go after each other with quite an enthusiastic hunger. So, where are you getting your blood? asked Decimus. <laughs> From the slaves, of course, said Gaius. The younger, the better. We also learned it's not necessary to kill the slaves. No, we simply draw a bit of blood before the games and keep them alive and well-fed until we need more blood. In the end, the entire plan is not nearly as costly as the old-style games. Now the slaves stay alive and the gladiators can be used to help defeat Rome's enemies. Hmm. But won't the crowd call for the gladiators? said Gaius. What if they prefer the old way of doing things? <sighs> Romans love violence more than anything, said Gaius. And there's nothing more savage than a fight to the, well, the end between two immortuous. Plus, the crowd even gets to participate. 
The men were interrupted by the sound of drums that seemed to erupt from under the chairs. Broad doors opened on the side of the Colosseum, and a formation of twenty drummers marched in. They hammered out a familiar war tune, and the spectators rose to their feet and cheered. When the drummers finished, they faced about and marched back outside. Decimus noticed the drummers seemed to be in a great hurry to get away from the Colosseum floor. Several looked over their shoulders when they should have been facing straight ahead. Decimus told himself he didn't blame the drummers and rubbed his fingers over his scar. Two doors on opposite sides of the Colosseum floor opened and the crowd became quiet. Directly above each door was a platform. A man holding a large jug stood on each of the platforms. Decimus saw movement in the south doorway. The first immortuous walked out into the sunlight. Its eyes were pale grey and had no pupils, and it did not squint or blink. It was wearing a simple tunic and was barefoot. A curved sword was strapped to its right arm, and a club was attached to its right wrist. It wore no helmet. Its skin matched the colour of its eyes. It also had a large gash in the centre of its chest, and dark, dried blood stained its torso and legs. It also had another wound on the back of its leg. The people in the crowd closest to the immortuous began to shout, and it slowly turned to face them. Then it walked straight at the wall and began gnawing at its surface, while it thrashed and reached up for the people just above it in the front row. Another immortuous entered the arena from the door on the right of the Colosseum. It was dressed the same way, and had the same grey, dead eyes. This one was armed with a long, double-bladed sword strapped to its right arm. Its left arm was missing and in its place the crowd could see a jagged wound with white bone protruding from its centre. The crowd became quiet again, but the first immortuous continued trying to get to the people sitting above it. Then the men on the platforms held up their jugs over the two immortuous, turned them upside down, and poured. Gallons of blood showered both creatures. I thought you said you only needed a bit of blood for this said Decimus. Oh, a small amount is really all that is needed, said Gaius, smiling. But we are trying to put on a show here. This is quite dramatic, wouldn't you agree? Decimus only grunted and turned back to the action. Both immortuous paused for a few seconds when the blood hit them. Then they turned and faced each other from across the sandy floor of the Colosseum. An odd moan came from both of them, and they began walking straight at each other. Neither walked fast, and the first one limped from the gash on its leg. Still, they sped up as much as they could as they drew closer and collided near the centre of the arena floor. Neither used its weapons for any real purpose. They thrashed and swung their arms, and occasionally did some damage. The one armed immortuous stood more than a head taller than the other one, and despite receiving half a dozen deep wounds, started to drive the smaller one back. The one-armed creature brought up its right arm and soared, and managed to impale the other one, pushing forward with such force that the blade went all the way through its opponent. The crowd gasped, then cheered, when they saw the blade go through the immortuous. By then, they were all standing up and screaming. They did not pick sides. They only cheered for the violence. The one-armed immortuous was unable to free its arm and sword from the torso of the other one. It jerked and twisted as it tried to get loose. The smaller one, ignoring the blade sticking out of its back, swung both of its arms up at the other, tearing chunks of flesh from its face and head. Its club came loose and fell to the ground and its curved sword pierced the right eye of the taller immortuous, and black liquid drained out of the socket. Both immortuous had their mouths open, but were not able to get their teeth on each other. Finally, after more blows and slashes from the smaller immortuous, the one-armed one began to sag. 
The other one began to swing with more energy and somehow drove its sword into the empty eye socket of its opponent. The one armed in Mortuus's legs gave way and it fell back, drawing its sword out of the torso of the other one as it struck the ground. The Immortuous lay still. The smaller one did not hesitate and dropped to its knees and began biting and tearing at the stomach of the other. In a few seconds, it had ripped open the skin and pulled out a long tube of intestine, which it shoved into its mouth. Up in the seats, Tertius turned to his father with raised eyebrows. Now, father? Now, son. Go ahead. The boy took out one of the stones from his pocket and threw it as hard as he could toward the centre of the arena. The rock sailed high in the air, dropped and struck the victorious Immortuous in the back. A few seconds later, nearly everyone in the crowd was throwing too, and the air was filled with thousands of stones of all sizes. <laughs> Good shot, son, said Tertius's father. You made the first hit. <laughs> I can tell you you've been practicing. The first volley struck the Immortuous like an avalanche. Its face disintegrated. The force of the impact slammed it down into the sand. It did not move for a few seconds, but then it pushed up onto its knees and reached again for the shredded intestines hanging out of the torso of the other one. The crowd roared and applauded. Then they threw everything they had, raining down rocks for a full five minutes. By the time they ran out of things to throw, the Immortuous lay still on its back. Its face and head pounded almost flat. Another door opened on the side of the arena, and four soldiers marched in. They were armed for battle, holding their swords and shields in front of them. They marched to the still forms on the sand. One of the soldiers raised his sword and severed the head of the first Immortuous, and the second one received the same treatment. Gaius turned toward Decimus. Well... What do you think? said Gaius. It was quite a show, eh? Decimus nodded. I have my doubts about all of this, Gaius. But I must admit, it is better to watch them fight each other than to face them, said Decimus. And the crowd certainly seemed to enjoy it. Well, my friend, this wouldn't have been possible if you and your soldiers hadn't brought them back from Thrace, said Gaius. I hope you will come to my villa this evening for celebration on the success of these new games. Many of my important friends will be there. Thank you, Gaius. It will be an honor to attend, said Decimus. That evening, Gaius's villa on the banks of the Tiber River was filled with music and laughter. The wine was plentiful, as Rome's upper class celebrated and congratulated Gaius on the game. General Decimus arrived wearing his formal tunic and rank insignia, and Gaius immediately rushed over to him. Ah, General, it is so good of you to join us. Come, come, I have several friends you must meet. Later that evening, after a sumptuous meal of roast pig and gallons of wine, Gaius, Decimus, and five other men sat on a veranda overlooking the city. Now, General, said Gaius, you must tell us the story of how you first encountered the Immortuous. The other men nodded in agreement. Decimus did not enjoy being the centre of attention, but he looked around him and realised he had no choice and began to speak. We fought several small actions against the Thracians, but had not met their main force, said Decimus. We could not locate them. It seemed that they had suddenly pulled back far from their positions. The Immortuous came one night, when most of my men were sleeping. There must have been several hundred of them. Our only warning was that damn moaning sound they make. It was chaos at first, with the noise and the darkness. But my centurions eventually got the men up and into formation. We lost too many men that night. But we did learn the only way to kill an Immortuous was to stab it in the head, or just to cut the head off. The men fought bravely and stopped them. 
A dozen of my men were bitten during the battle. They became sick very quickly and died within two hours. The medics placed their bodies behind the hospital tent to await burial the next day. I woke in the morning to more moaning, and this time it was right outside my tent. I grabbed my sword and ran outside and saw five of my men, ones who had died after being bitten, staggering through the camp. Three of them came at me, and I saw they had the grey, pale eyes of corpses. They were dead, but they were up and walking, trying to bite me. I think they wanted to eat me. Some of my living soldiers joined me, and we stopped the immortuous. Decimus stopped and rubbed the scar on his face. General, if they were so dangerous, then why did you bring some of them back to Rome? said one of the men. I felt we should not risk letting our enemies get them, said Decimus. In fact, the Thracians may have released the horde that attacked our camp. I decided we might be able to study them and use them against our enemies. Then, of course, our friend Gaius here came up with his exciting idea to use them in the games. Tell us, General, you faced the Immortuous. You have seen what they can do. What do you think of using them in the games? asked another man. It was an exciting spectacle, and the crowd did enjoy it, said Decimus. But the Immortuous are very, very dangerous and hard to stop, even for experienced troops, if they ever get loose in Rome. <laughs> well, General, we don't have to worry about that, said Gaius, interrupting. They are locked in the strongest cages we have in the Colosseum. We have ten of them down there right now. Now, Gaius, what are you going to do when you run out of Immortuous? Send the army out looking for more? said the man who had asked the previous question. Oh, that's very simple, said Gaius. We shall make more. More? But how? said the man. We shall simply allow one of the immortuous to bite several prisoners, said Gaius. They will quickly die, and then they will come back to life as immortuous, ready to entertain the citizens of Rome. While Gaius's party went on until late in the night, the two guards at the Colosseum assigned to watch the Immortuous's cages were also enjoying themselves. They had attended the games and drank wine for most of the day. Drunk when they reported for duty at nightfall, they continued to drink courtesy of a flask one of them carried inside his tunic. The excitement of the day and the alcohol became too much for the guards and, by midnight, both were asleep on the ground near the cages. This explained why they did not hear the immortuous clawing at the cage doors. The sleeping guards also did not hear when one of the immortuous smashed the wood frame on the cage. Back at Gaius's house, it took General Decimus three tries to climb up on his horse, thanks to the wine he'd consumed during the party. He pointed the horse in the direction of the army barracks where he had a room in the senior officer's quarters. He was thankful the horse seemed to know the way, as he was having trouble making his eyes focus. He reached the barracks and collapsed, asleep. The guards at the Colosseum woke up just in time to die. The ten immortuous crashed through the cage and were on the guards before they had time to reach for their weapons. The guards were not much of a meal for the hungry mortuous, and they lurched out of the Colosseum into the streets of Rome, as the eastern sky was turning grey with the first hint of the new day. General Decimus woke to a banging, throbbing in his skull. He thought at first it was the wine and swore out loud, but then he realised someone was pounding on his door. Decimus staggered to his feet and swung the door open. Standing there was Decanus Clovius, one of his most experienced centurions. General, you must come quickly. There is some trouble at the Colosseum. Minutes later, Decimus arrived at the Colosseum and leapt from his horse. He saw a crowd of soldiers standing in a circle looking at something on the ground. 
He pushed his way past them and saw the condition of the corpses, and he knew. He turned to Decanus Clovius. Gather as many soldiers as you can find. Make sure they are armed for battle, said Decimus. We move out in fifteen minutes. Gaius arrived at the Colosseum, just as Decimus was leading his men out into the street. General Decimus, how could this have happened? asked Gaius. Where could the Immortals have gone? They are not difficult to track, said Decimus. As the soldiers marched east from the Colosseum, they approached a low building with many doors and manicured flowers and trees. They heard high-pitched screams coming from inside. Gaius, what is that building? said Decimus. It is a school, said Gaius. Then we are too late, said Decimus. That was absolutely brilliant, wasn't it? I love that one. Take a familiar concept such as zombies and put them into ancient Rome, and, well, what a fantastic result that was. Oh, loved it. <laughs> what did you think? Come on, tell me in the comments below the video. And, as ever, even though I'm quite a busy, I will do my best to reply to as many as I can. Now, well, that's it for this week, but I will be back again on Monday as ever. Are you going to join me, aren't you? Go on, tell me you will. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, then. All right, see you again soon. You have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?